Hey everyone, and welcome to this second episode of Always on CX and EX presented by Audio Codes Voca. Here we talk about customer experience, employee experience, and everything in between. I'm your host, Josh Cronister. Today I'm joined by Brandon Smith I'm here to talk about the topic of why voice is still the leading support channel and how to delight your callers. So I asked Brandon to join us for this topic because of the amount of time that he spends speaking with contact center leaders, IT leaders, leaders in customer experience, which is pretty much all day, every day. But Brandon, maybe you can give us a little more background into your experience in the contact center. Sure, absolutely. So I, I've been in UC and contact center communications for about 17 years here, basically right after I got out of college. Started off with Nortel, joined a local Kansas, Kansas City-based company here for about a year or so, and then went to Avaya, then Tata Communications, then Nice and Contact, and now I'm here at Audio Codes focused on contact center sales here. Love it. So you're, uh, I'm sure, a proud Kansas City native, um, especially in the last month or so with the, with the Chiefs winning the Super Bowl. Absolutely. I'm originally from Wichita, Kansas, but my parents both grew up here. I have been a born and bred Chiefs fan. So uh, <laughs> I, I think the Onion, the fake news article uh, or fake newspaper said, uh, this is the last Super Bowl Kansas City gets before everybody hates us. And I think that's probably about right. And I'm willing to wear that as a Kansas City fan. <laughs> You're definitely on the way to that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's been a lot of employee turnover, um, especially among agents in recent years. So, you know, what is something that a company can do to help influence their employee experience that then leads into providing a great customer experience? Sure, absolutely. I, I mean, it's been interesting because I think you bring up a really good point. I, I've read a few articles in the Wall Street Journal, and they, they kind of said there's really two significant trends that have happened here in the past couple of years. Let's call it in COVID times, for lack of a better term, the past three years. They said two things. In the past year, really, people are trying to get experiences and activities done that they weren't able to do during the pandemic. So they're calling into customer service lines, and they're, they want demands, they're demanding things of those agents that they might not have demanded three, four years ago. They want these experiences. They want to get them done now. They feel like they've lost out on time. And now they want to take advantage of that. So that's one compounding factor. But the other factor is, just as you said, there's a lot of turnover these days. With the Great Resignation, another Wall Street Journal article, I read the Wall Street Journal a pretty good amount, they kind of said, why does everything kind of seem a little bit slower than a few years ago? Maybe things don't seem as crisp as they did before the pandemic. They said it's not even necessarily the pandemic itself. It's the fact that with the Great Resignation, a lot of people who had tenured positions at maybe one company or in one type of business have now moved on to new businesses or moved on to completely different fields. And so now, for lack of a term, everybody's new in their job. There's new contact center agents, there's new managers, supervisors, IT personnel in contact centers, just speaking about customer experience. So there's um, kind of a brand new wave of personnel that has to be assimilated and brought up to speed to be able to support this. So when we talk about how to make that experience better for employees, I'm always a big fan of companies putting their uh, employees in the best position to succeed. And what I mean by that is when we talk about how to present a caller to an agent, a lot of times trying to make sure that agent has the best context available, the best information available to them, A. B, you're not bogging them down with activities in call that might smother their ability to talk or think on their own. And C, you've got the customer in as good of a mental state as possible. And what I mean by that is I know of many people who get really frustrated when they're presented with, say, DTMF IVR menus or a lot of different options when they really just want to speak to an agent. And if you can get a caller to an agent as quickly as possible, I think you're going to have a happier caller first and foremost, and that makes for a happier agent. The agent really is kind of the foundation of the call, and that has to be stable and working well for everything else to work. And so I feel like just letting them do their thing, trusting them a little bit, and making sure that you're presenting them with people as quickly as possible and with as much information as possible is the best way to make sure that they're successful with that caller. We've all been on those calls where uh, maybe you've been sitting on hold for like an hour. Yes. <laughs> or maybe it's even like 20 minutes. And then you jump on and you might have a little bit of a tone in your voice. Yeah. And that can be portrayed onto the agent. And you never know what kind of day they're having. Ex- they having a bad exactly. Day? Yeah. You know? And then that can relay into it, especially if if an agent is in like maybe – 
they're having a difficult time with their job or they're not presented with all the tools that they need to do or resources to do their job effectively. It can lead into a little bit of strain, you know, that's in anyone's role too. So exactly. I I, I mean, just earlier today, you know, I had a tense conversation with a colleague and everything. Those things happen. It's, it's, it's funny because I went to the Genesis Inspire conference a few weeks ago and I'm not trying to sound like a Genesis advocate or certainly we, we partner with Genesis and everything, but they're a lot of their taglines and they even had a book. It was empathy matters. And I think that's really important to consider, not just for your customers, but for your employees as well. And my point is, it's hard for an a, a, an agent to have empathy for customers when the company doesn't have empathy for them. In the sense of, you want to present them with the best information and put them in the best position to succeed. And I just feel like a lot of organizations understand that empathy piece for the customer, but they really need to consider that for the agents as well and putting them in the best position so that they can delight their customers. But why do you think voice support continues to be the leading channel for customer service, especially with the growth among digital channels of, you know, email and chat? Yeah, I I think that's a really good question because I think a lot of people rightfully think of digital channels as emerging and they absolutely are. But a lot of times I think that we kind of forget the um, traditional metrics by which people are calling a contact center. Why are people calling into a contact center? It's usually because a lot of times they can't self-serve. I mean, I feel like contact centers and, and, and some of these digital channels are perfect for low leverage scenarios, particularly the digital channels like chat, email, SMS, those sorts of things. I say low leverage, meaning low stakes. And what I mean is paying a bill, checking an account balance, checking the shipping information of something that's non-critical to say your business or your personal life. But when it comes to real-time communication, real-time updates, humans interact with humans. There's a reason that we built society up around people and around proximity to people. And that's because we need things from each other. And so in that sense, a contact center is for people to help people and for people to communicate with each other to say, please, I need some help. I want some empathy. I want somebody right here to help me. Can you be that expert and help me out? And so when we reach those high leverage scenarios, hey, my credit card's been stolen. Hey, my flight has been canceled and I have to be there tomorrow without fail. Um, you know, this shipment is incredibly important. Maybe it's a medical device or some sort of medical uh, um, solution that that is urgent for a patient or for the success of some sort of surgery or something like that. Those are high leverage scenarios. And those are scenarios where you can't assume that automation or non-real time engagements are going to get the job done. It's just going to stress the person out. It's going to stress them to not be able to interact with the person and get those real time updates. So I think as we've evolved these digital channels, they're fantastic to melt away some of those unnecessary calls into agents. You know, again, those balance checking scenarios, those routine sort of day to day tasks. But As things grow in importance, as we do more online commerce and therefore have more expectations of online commerce, my belief is that voice was always going to be the first and foremost thing, even amongst younger generations. I'm a millennial here, but even amongst Gen Z and people like that, if they need support immediately, they don't necessarily want to speak to a bot. They want to speak to a person who can really engage with them, go back and forth and give them that peace of mind in real time. Especially if you think about, you know, Say someone is on the way to the airport and they have they got a notification that their flight was canceled. You know they're not going to open up and and write an email um, to a support line. They're probably going to get on their phone and have a conversation while they're driving. Exactly. Um, or any other time. So, and there are also great times for when you know using chat of if someone is in a place where they can't be talking on the phone. That's mm-hmm. a great example of that where they can use that and, and have their problem solved with chat, but. I'm the same way. Uh, I may be biased there, but I enjoy actually having a conversation with someone. It feels like you kind of, you relate with that person. You can more easily express um, everything that's going on, whether it's an issue, um, more so than having to type it all out. Absolutely. Yeah. And and the, the fact that, you know, we can't type as fast as we can speak. The fact that a lot of times if you're typing, you're waiting for somebody to type their response. It, it again, it comes back to that empathy element that I was speaking about a little earlier in, in the sense of 
you want the employee to have the best success possible. And in that respect, you want to serve them up a customer who's not already angry. They're going to be stressed, right? Everybody who calls into a contact center almost by their nature is going to be stressed for some reason or another. It's a canceled flight. It's a, a missing package. It's something like that. So they want help quickly. And my view on it is it's the duty of contact center administrators and us as technology specialists to make sure that we're putting that customer in the best mental state of mind before we hand them off to an agent. Cool. Brandon, so we talked about, you know, a couple industries, you know, packages and flights being canceled and things like that. But, you know, maybe you can share some examples of companies who are doing an exceptional job with their voice support and maybe what what makes their approach more effective. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's interesting because since we work in technology, we're always evaluating the technology we ever call into a contact center. Uh, we're always kind of nitpicking as to what they could be doing better, what they're doing well. Last night, I actually had to call into Target's contact center. And there were a number of things I thought they could improve on. But one of the things that at least in my couple calls to them that I really liked is it basically presented me with one menu from a DTMF perspective, and then it routed me down into a sub menu, and there was only one option. And as soon as I pressed that option, it was immediately routing me to an agent. I feel like a lot of times trying to have too many sub menus, trying to have people listen to irrelevant options from a DTMF perspective is one of the key ways to get them frustrated. And I really appreciated the target tried to avoid that and tried to, all right, we're going to give you one option. Once you get there, all right, you pick your option. We're getting you to an agent. I think that's a really good way to do it. Now, maybe my favorite example of, um, uh, communications or kind of um, properly serving up customers to agents is actually there's a, a, a credit union here in the Kansas City area. I'm not sure if I can share their name, but uh, it, it's a, a somewhat large credit union here in the Kansas City area, which I'm a member of. And one of the things that they do is they have kiosks all throughout their bank, video based kiosks where you put in your card and you're immediately served up a, 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 whether you want voice or you want video. It's a real time contact center agent right then or there. You get to see their face, you get to have a conversation, they can ask you questions, ask for clarification immediately. Same thing on their app. They have an app and they have a call us button and we have the capability to immediately get in touch with a contact center agent. I can only speak for myself, but I've traditionally found that even if it takes longer for me to get to an, a live person, an actual agent, knowing that one is coming is, is, is uh, very beneficial to me. Even if I have to say, I'm going to call back a little bit later or something like that, I would much prefer to wait for a live interaction because I know what I'm going to need is going to be somewhat difficult if I'm calling into the contact center. And the fact that they're always making somebody available in whatever form or fashion, whether you decide to go into the bank, whether you're using their app, whether you decide to call in, whether you use their website, they're going to present you a live person, no matter the interaction. That, in my opinion, is the best way to service their customers. Yeah, that's a fantastic example because it reminds me also of you get onto a DTMF menu and next thing you know, you're like four sub menus deep and there's still nine options and you're like, wait, what was the first one again? Yes. And then, yeah. and then you just find yourself just pounding zero, like speak to an agent, speak to an agent. And, uh, but having something that, you know, setting it up to where, all right, they click, you know, main menu or they're on to one sub menu and then you're already getting passed to an agent to have an actual conversation. Exactly. And and one of the things at the risk of talking about myself or my career too much, you know, we just recently um, signed a deal to help kind of uh, transform a contact center, certainly an IVR menu for a customer. And, you know, they had, I believe it was 37 options, um, you know, between main menus and sub menus that they were offering to their callers. And we said, guys, this isn't 2002 anymore. You know, this is, we've evolved and there's a lot of ways in which we can use technology now to improve that customer experience. And just like you said, they'd have a main menu that had nine different options plus zero to hear those menus again. Plus they had, I think, multiple sub menus with seven or eight components. And we, we timed out some of them. We said it was a minute and a half or so. And so if somebody had I'm making something of option number eight on the main menu and then option number seven on the secondary menu. It was going to be a minute and a half of waiting, listening to irrelevant options before they had the opportunity to do that. And now that we've really evolved IVRs, there's true conversation, natural language, understanding capabilities within a contact center. I said, how about instead of you making them listen to irrelevant DTMF options, you just literally say, thank you for calling manufacturer. How can we route your call? 
and letting them use the power of their voice. And then again, that's that's that trying to find that way to serve up happy customers. And if the customer is not listening to a minute, minute and a half of irrelevant options, I see that as one of the key ways to let them choose where they want to go and not listen to relevant options. And they're just going to be a naturally happy customer then. Yeah. And you also mentioned earlier of people um, when they are have an issue, they have identified that they probably need to get it solved. They will start by doing research on their own. So mm -hmm. if you have um, a very large DTMF menu that goes into many sub menus, what are some options on there that can be added to say your website as like a frequently asked question or, or someone, mm -hmm. something there to have people be able to service those, those issues um, by themselves. Um, and then that way having less options for someone when they're on a call to make sure that they are having a better experience. So they're not having to listen through three minutes of options to choose from. Exactly. Or even maybe offering up, you know, as sort of a preamble, you know, thank you for calling company. If you need assistance with our website, go here, you go to www or something like that. Trying to get some of those immediate elements out of the way first is probably a good way to approach it if you can't provide a conversational approach. But in my opinion, if you have that natural language or text to speech, speech to text sort of environment, I'd try and leverage that as much as possible because I have found that cutting down the amount of time people have to wait is is really key and it is, is trying to do that and trying to let them use the power of their voice to cut down that wait time. People are probably going to take that option every time. So what would you say is the level of voice expertise that most companies have um, today? And what is something that a company who has maybe less experience in voice do to help with that? Sure. I, I think it, it really today, unfortunately, it kind of goes along the lines of financials. And what I mean is I think a lot of the larger companies have more time, more resources, more people to expend on voice and becoming experts on it. Um, of course, there's fantastic organizations all across from the smallest of organizations to the largest of organizations that are really good at voice. I think people are better at voice than they may assume. And what I mean by that, that is this, is I think a lot of times organizations understand what customers want. They're met by the challenges of the market, meaning trying to save money, trying to save time, or trying to save on manpower from a contact center perspective. So they try and use more digital channels because they just don't feel as though they can support customers appropriately just using voice. Um, what I'm a big fan of is certainly talk to some, some consulting companies. You can obviously talk to audio codes. You can talk to, there's a lot of good consulting vendors out there today, even some of the contact center vendors will have, say, entire organizations that would be happy to come and talk to you about maybe some ways in which you could approach this and improve the voice experience of your customers. So I, I, I don't necessarily think that the um, expertise level is missing. I think it's about refining it um, because I think as we've moved into digital channels, a lot of times organizations have seen that as a catch-all for any sort of calls they want to keep out of agents' hands or, or sort of a, a blanket approach that we take for certain engagements. And that's not probably the best way to approach it and especially not for high leverage situations. So I think working with an organization that maybe does have that voice experience, whether that's a contact center organization, a consulting firm, a systems integrator, something like that with perhaps a strong consulting arm. I'm a big fan of trying to engage some of them and, and trying to see if they can provide some direction on, hey, where can we get better? What are some of the environments that we can uh, put our agents into to make sure that they're more successful? And, and what are the options or lack of options that we can provide our customers to make sure that they're in the best frame of mind when we actually present them to an agent. So so I, I, I don't necessarily want to say that anybody's bad at voice. It's more of a matter of thinking about the process, thinking about when and where people need support in your organization, and really taking a step back and saying, what can we do to best make these agents and these customers happy when we get them together? Yeah, like you mentioned of refinement, especially in today's, you know, what's going on economically, it may, it may not be that you need a new shiny solution. It might be that you already have what you need. It just needs to be refined a little bit more. 
Ex exactly right. And I mean, if you are looking at a brand new solution, I mean, we're in such an interesting time from a technology perspective. I mean, I mean, it's <laughs> I, I've heard so much about chat GPT and chat bots, real time agent assist, sentiment analysis. There's so many technologies that to be clear, it would be very easy for somebody to not be a voice expert. I, I would say I think people are voice experts, but they're not maybe uh, modern application experts. I'm not still a modern application expert. There's technologies out there that I still don't understand. And I mean, I talk about this all day long. And and so in that respect, it's it's you, you need education both on what can we do to improve the experience with what we have, and then what else is out there that we can really identify as a need for us or a way to improve our business, and then work with a, a manufacturer or consultant to help implement that. Cool. So what are some of the biggest challenges faced by contact centers when it comes to providing high quality voice support and how can these challenges be overcome? Yeah, I, 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 I think, um, as I was kind of saying earlier, I think right now it, it's, it's a resource issue and whether that's money or whether that's people, I think that's the biggest issue facing contact centers today. You know, for all my talk about, you know, the, the, the we're kind of in the COVID times or semi after COVID times, you know, I, I, I know there's a lot of opinions on that, but the thought process here is we're in a new environment that is a lot different than the status quo three, four, five years ago. And so there's more demands of a contact center agent. There's more calls. There's more actual interactions going on. Um, and also there's a lot of new technologies that companies are having to kind of sort out. They're having to sort out all of those sorts of things. It's, it is the, tr the classic, how do we do more with less? Or even how do we do more with all these different applications that I don't know what they do? You know, and so in that respect, I, I, I always recommend some of the best ways. I mentioned obviously working with some consulting firms. I, I, I've worked, talked about, uh, you know, trying to maybe see if you can work with uh, a systems integrators or even a manufacturer to talk about some ways in which you can improve the experience of your existing equipment. I'm a big fan too of a lot of the research that Forrester and Gartner and some of those other tech evaluation firms do. You know, some of the things like the Magic Quadrants and, uh, you, you know, uh, those sorts of reports I've found to be very, very strong. And a lot of organizations I know, they, they more or less live off of those or they say, you know, who are we going to look for for our solution? Look at the upper right hand corner of, a, of one of those quadrants and that'll tell you where we're going to go. So so I would say there's a lot of ways to kind of educate yourself. I would recommend taking those steps. Um, and, and then a lot of it, too, I think is I, I try and talk to companies that can offer, say, demonstrations and um, live uh, trials of, of these solutions too. And what I mean by that is this, we've entered this time of, um, uh, 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 we've entered this time in which there's a lot of new applications, a lot of people don't even know what they do, and they really need to kind of play around with them in their own environment. And in the past, maybe this was only accessible to Fortune 100 companies, Fortune 500 companies, something like that. We've gotten to the point where I mentioned natural language understanding and text to speech, speech to text and everything like that. I mean, I, I used to sell that, you know, 10, 12 years ago, and that was a big, big dollar item. I mean, you know, that was something that only big, big firms with five, 10,000 plus uh, agents could really afford. Well, now it's kind of proliferated downwards to the point where 50, 100 agent organizations can take advantage of it. So it's understandable that it's a new technology for them. They're trying to figure out how best to use it. Um, so a lot of times I'm a big fan of if, if you can work with the organization, perhaps you're looking at a new solution, let them ha let you have a free trial of it. Let them see if there's uh, some sort of, uh, you know, whether it's try and buy system or, um, you know, something like that. So you can actually see it, touch it in, in your environment firsthand, see how it works and make sure that it's lining up to your needs. I'm a big fan of trying to find organizations that have the capability to do that for you. Yeah, I would say it's definitely the standard now. Even having the option of doing a I don't know, 30 or 60 day trial where you can even put in your own um, data and information and have it be accessed as like real time. You're not just using fake numbers and, and fake experiences, but you're using mm -hmm. your own real time experience. Um, that can help influence and and provide you um, with a with a good decision. Um, Absolutely, yeah. It's, it, as we've moved into sort of this cloud first world, one of the really neat things is, you know, servers can be spun up quickly, applications can be spun up quickly. It doesn't have to be a dedicated environment. It can be something that's maybe on a shared tenant. Obviously, there's security concerns and things like that. But if you want to trial something, absolutely, th there's very few scenarios in which you shouldn't be able to give something a try, even if it's not in 
perhaps a live uh, with real agents environment, maybe with your lab, with test data, with test calls or something like that. I'm a big fan of giving that a try. And we're in a world now where that's much more easily doable than even say five, six years ago when a lot of things were still focused on premise based, uh, um, dedicated build outs and things like that made it hard to test these sorts of things out. But now we're in kind of an application cloud first world should be a lot easier. And so I can't say that every application is simple enough that you just snap your fingers and you can trial it. But I think that you'll find that a lot of solutions out there in, in the contact center, whether that's a routing solution, a reporting solution, analytic solution, there, there's definitely ways to trial this or, or sample it, for lack of a better term, that aren't necessarily going to require three months of time and a dedicated build out and a brand new network architecture to make it happen. All right, Brandon. So what would you say are some of the best practices that organizations can implement um, to improve their voice support and increase customer satisfaction? Yeah, I, I mean, a metric that I always hold to, and I want to be clear, this is Brandon's opinion. This isn't something that I've heard, you know, stated many times, uh, you know, throughout the industry or something like that. But something that I'm a big fan of when I think of being empathetic towards customers and agents is not to obscure an opportunity to get to a live human agent. Let me explain what I mean. I understand why websites and organizations try to um, offload things to self-service and get customers to try and do their homework before engaging with contacts and range. I get that and that's important, but I've never found that to be a solid substitute for not giving them the option to call and reach a, a person, okay? Or, or find some way to interact with a live person. I mean, an example here is, I can't remember the name of the organization. Uh, I think it's Get to Person, I wanna say is the website. Their sole job is to try and find you the 800 number to try and reach customer service if it's obscured. I, I hate that concept as, as a consumer, as somebody who works in technology. I, I've never found the solution to be to obscure an opportunity to get in touch with us because I think it's an opportunity where they, they get in touch with you and they're speaking with you live. It's an upsell to cross sell opportunity. It's a an opportunity to delight them, to really ex expand and show that empathy and human emotion and interaction. I, I, I just, you, you, I don't feel as though you're going to delight people as much with digital experiences as you are a live person, whether that's via voice or video. So step number one in Brandon's opinion, if I, if I had a magic wand, I would say, make your 800 number known, present people with information. Do you want to have the opportunity to drop out of queue? Yes, we'll call you back. Okay, that's an excellent technology. Big fan of that. Or present them with their place in queue or their wait time. Those are good things, okay? If the customer wants to reach you, let them reach you, even if you present them with an, okay, it's going to be 30 or 40 minutes, but we look forward to serving you. I, as a customer, would much rather hear that rather than spend 10, 15, 20 minutes just trying to find the phone number um, before I even have that opportunity to make that decision for myself. I'd also say, um, as I've mentioned, as technologies have kind of proliferated outwards and now smaller organizations are able to leverage this, if you're using digital channels, which again, very, very in favor of, but give it an op, make sure it's an omni channel sort of solution, meaning if you start with a chat, if you start with an email, if you start with an SMS and the customer is getting frustrated, they clearly want to speak to a person, give them the opportunity to speak to a person and make sure that all of that context of that call is available. Meaning, don't make them just call an 800 number, re-authenticate with the IVR and reach a brand new agent. Make sure that there's a way to get to that agent they were interacting with before and all of that context is available to them as well. And then the third thing that I'm a big fan of, I kind of already mentioned this, is using a conversational IVR, using natural language understanding to, to allow people to say where they want to go. I know that technology is not everywhere. I understand that it's not as simple as I'm probably making it seem. But if you possibly have the opportunity to bring in NLU or natural language understanding into your environment, I really feel as though that's one of the key ways you're going to be able to get people to be delighted with their experience and as happy as possible or at least not as frustrated as possible when you serve them up to an agent. Because a lot of times, if they have to go through irrelevant menu options or they're pressing zero a bunch of times, that's one of the key triggers that I found in my life and with people I know, that's one of the key triggers to frustrate them and make sure that they're already grumpy when they're presented with the agent. And when you're an agent in that scenario, I'm not going to say it's a no-win scenario, but already the cards are stacked against you. And again, I think it's up to organizations to not stack the, the, the cards against those agents. Loved your first point, and it made me think of something. When you mentioned letting the caller know 
you know, where they are in the queue or how much time to expect in order to get on a, on a conversation with an agent. Maybe think of like, you know, say you're going, it's Friday night, you're going out to have a nice dinner with, with your wife or with your family and you show up and there's a wait. Mm -hmm. And what if the hostess never provided you with where you are in line or how much time to expect in order to get a table? They just say, yep, we put you, we put you on the list. And then that was it. You never knew anything else of when to come back, when you might um, expect to be in line. Is it 30 minutes or there's 10 other people ahead of you? Okay, I might leave and come back later or come mm -hmm. back another night or something like that. Um, and that's almost the experience that a lot of people get when they call into a contact center. If they, they're just kind of left out in the blue. They don't know how much time to to a lot to be on the phone. You know, a lot of a lot of times you have to call during your work day. Um, yes. And often you don't have the time to just sit on a call for, for that. You know, maybe it's an hour when you're in meetings and doing work. Um, but to be able to, you know, leave your name and your number and then have that, um, have the contact center agent call you back, even be able to schedule a, a date and time when they can call you back that fits Absolutely. with your schedule. I, I, I think you brought up a really interesting scenario because contact centers had always focused on people first, get it to a person and have them wait as long as you need to without giving them that sort of information. And um, restaurants in the past, conversely, you had to go sit there and wait. And it was a question mark as to how long you were going to wait. And as somebody who hates to wait, I can tell you that as it relates to contacts and queues, um, I hate the concept of sitting there on hold um, it, it, while I appreciate it. And I'm certainly willing to do that. Yeah. I, I'm a big believer in give them the opportunity to drop out or at least understand where they're at in line, or if they want to drop out and be called back. Exactly. Let's set up an appointment. Let's do that. Happy to do that because, because I, I, again, I think people are okay when there's no good option, you can't present somebody a person immediately. People don't mind if you have to say, here are your options, which one would you like? But I think a lot of times, if you're not even presenting them with that amount of time they have to wait, then they're left feeling as though they only have one option and they're going to sit there and they're going, just going to be so frustrated. I feel that same way as it relates to not presenting that phone number, you know, trying to force them into self-service if they, again, need immediate help or something like that. People get frustrated when they don't have the option to make the choice themselves. Themselves. And so giving them those options and presenting them to them and say, here are your options is going to be a lot better way to approach it rather than saying, well, here you are, you're stuck. Good luck. All right, Brandon, your expert opinion. We'd love to hear, you know, how will the future of voice support look in the next to say one to three years? And what are some changes that maybe we can expect uh, to see in terms of, of technology and customer expectations? I think there's a technology that's going to start proliferating downwards even more and going to provide a lot of value. And, and that's what's called agent assist or, or kind of if you've ever heard of bots or AI or something like that, the concept of obviously being able to self-serve with something that sounds and acts like a real human agent, that's something that's really important and is going to happen. But also trying to make agents more effective by giving them sort of tools or a bot or an assistant who's helping them in real time, I see that as being one of the big things that's going to happen here as call volumes continue growing. Um, but again, we have to deal with the great resignation, the fact that a lot of people are transitioning in and out of the industry. I think you're going to see a lot more reliance on those um, intelligent virtual agents and agent assistant bots whose job is to actually help out contact center agents in real time with uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, simplistic tasks or, or repetitive tasks that maybe even agents don't like to do. I think the other thing that if you'd have told me six months ago, this was going to be a big thing, I'd have said, no, uh -uh. And, and now here we are, it's 2023, is chat GPT. I am shocked at what that tool can do and what sort of things people are using that tool to do in a contact center, whether that's gauging sentiment analysis, coming up with, say, responses that somebody can use, helping with that self-service element. People are going to be leveraging chat GPT um, in a lot of different ways that I can't even fathom at this point in time. Um, and it doesn't just have to be chat GPT. I mean, there's so many other bot infrastructures and frameworks and, and solutions that are fantastic. Obviously, chat GPT isn't going to take over everything 
game. But that concept that it's brought in, that AI is now to the point where it can really, really figure out exactly what you want. It can gather all this information at our fingertips and put it in a legible, usable form immediately. It's going to shock us all, I think, where the agent and the customer experience is going to be three, four, five years from now when we've had the opportunity to refine a tool like that. So in the short term, I imagine it might be a little messy. It's a little bit of the Wild West as it relates to some of these bot frameworks and some of leveraging this AI and this automated intelligence in order to improve the customer and the agent experience. But I, I, I think we're going to see things be wildly different in two or three years, whether it's through automation completely, whether it's automating some mundane tasks so that agents don't have to worry about those and can focus on more of the knowledge work or if it's uh doing other sorts of things around the contacts and her calls whether it's wrap-up work whether it's other sorts of um uh, uh, sentiment analysis action item sort of things i think we're going to see ai and automation really uh, revolutionize the way in which contact center agents work and callers engage with contact centers. So, so it's, it's, again, I, it, it's funny because it's kind of like, you're asking me, you know, um, if, if we were at the beginning of the pandemic, how do you think the next three months or three years are going to look like it, it would have been way different. You know, my response three years ago would have been way different than what it is now. And I, I would say with the onset of a lot of these AI solutions, my response three years from now, uh, three years from now, I never would have been able to to have predicted what we're seeing today. So it's it's going to be really interesting. And I think that's going to be we're, we're going to see a lot of really unique innovation and a lot of really unique ways in which companies can leverage this to their advantage. Yeah. I love that. Makes it a fun industry to be in. It is. Yeah. As I say, it's never boring. Never boring. <laughs> That's for darn sure. Yeah. So. And also, I think it's important to kind of emphasize like, you know, those bot frameworks and, and chat GPT and things like that, you know, they're not meant or we don't really see them as something to completely replace the agent, but replace some of those mundane, easier tasks that could be done by uh, an AI tool. Mm -hmm. That way it frees up your agents to be able to focus more on the difficult questions or something that needs to be a conversation with a customer that then leads to um, a happier customer and delighting mm -hmm. the customer, which then passes back into that employee experience of, you know, the agent gets to focus on actually helping someone with a problem that they have and then that brings back of you know being able to put out empathy and feeling good that you're providing a great service when those are the pieces of your job that you're able to focus on it just provides better employee experience a better customer experience exactly happier you, customer if, if you can take out of a, a contacts and agents job some of the manual work tied to looking something up in a database or gathering some sort of records or documenting certain things, if some sort of automated tool, some sort of AI process can do that for them, I, I think most agents would tell you, oh, I'd love that. You know, to your point, these are not activities that th that. I, I have family members who've been contact center agents and things like that. These are not activities that they want to do. They want they want to talk to people. They want to help solve problems. But those are sort of the um, mundane elements that come with solving the problems. So if you can really just let them use the power of their character, their knowledge in order to fix these problems and not have to worry about those nagging little day-to-day -day mundane tasks in order to make that happen, I think they and the customers would be really, really happy with it. Awesome, Brandon. This was this was really good. Thank you very much for your time and wisdom on this topic. Absolutely. My pleasure. This was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. <laughs> good. Okay, so that's a wrap for this episode of Always on CX and EX. Again, this is where we talk about customer experience, employee experience, and everything in between. If you're watching and you have any questions, feel free to um, leave those in the comment box. Uh, myself or Brandon would be happy to uh, answer. Also, if you have any specific topics that you might want to see covered or discussed in future sessions, um, we would love to have a conversation with you and see how we can implement those. Um, but until then, we'll see you next month.